Good evening, church, and uh, welcome out to our evening service. I hope you enjoyed that message this morning by Brother Knickerbocker. We'll also be hearing uh, from him again. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with our songs to this evening. And uh, we'll be with 595, 595, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. You would sing it out with us. Oh 
wonderful song, and I hope that you're having a closer walk with the Lord at this time, and uh, you know he's just a prayer away. So uh, let's go to him now, and uh, we'll seek his guidance and his help on our service tonight. Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, we thank you for this time where we're able to uh, take a moment and meet together in spirit, and we're thankful for the truth of God's word, and uh, Lord, for our preacher that will be preaching, as well as the songs and the truth of the songs that we're singing, that Lord, they would touch our hearts and that we would know, Father, that you're here with us even in this time, and I pray that you would um, continue to help our church guide us through this time and Lord that you would be able to bring us back to meeting together uh, Lord physically as soon as possible Lord I pray that you would uh, bless our speaker tonight and we ask these things in Jesus name amen amen and we'll turn over to hymn number 345 hymn number 345 grace greater than all our sin
at this time with some announcements. All right, go ahead. Hello and good evening, everyone, and uh, happy Mother's Day again to all the moms. And we thank God for uh, godly moms and godly parents in general that uh, raise up the next generation for the Lord. And that's something that is so needful in our day. And we're thankful for the home and uh, trust and hope that the messages from Brother Knickerbocker are a help to our families and encouragement and a challenge to all of us uh, during this time. We want to just again welcome everyone to our service and we want to welcome maybe any first time visitors that might be watching. And we just encourage you if you're able to click the connection card link on our website or you can leave us a message on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Leave us your name and how you heard about our church. And also you can leave us a prayer request and we'd be so happy to connect with you. And so we again welcome you. Uh, we want to continue reminding our, our church members of all the ministries that we have happening uh, online uh, during this time. Uh, I want to remind you of the Bible studies that are being uh, uploaded every week for the children, BBC Kids. And I know the kids always look forward to winning the prize for the week and uh, being the first one to submit their answers. But you can find a BBC Kids program for children sixth grade and, and under. There's a teen Bible study and uh, we have an adult Bible study that we're going through the book, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Bible doctrines right now as you go through Bibliology. And so you can find all of that on our website, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube page. And then on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we encourage young adults to join us for a special Zoom Bible study. Uh, this Tuesday for the young adults is going to be a, a very special meeting. Uh, we're going to have a missionary and a close friend of mine join us. A missionary to Ecuador, Josh Poss, is going to be on with us. We'll have a chance to hear from him and ask some questions and fellowship together. So that's Tuesday night at 7 p.m. for the young adults, and we'll get you all the link there for that meeting. We also want to um, just remind folks to be praying for a couple of things. I was told that uh, this week it's the Ogbovo's 25th wedding anniversary, and so we thank God for that. Happy anniversary to the Ogbovo's. And if you have any announcements like that, let us know a birthday or anniversary. We want to celebrate with you and let everyone know. But happy anniversary to the Obovo family. And then we also want to be praying for some people. Uh, we were notified by Abby and Abraham to pray for their dad who is in the hospital. They found out he has a brain tumor and getting tests done and different procedures to just find out what his next steps will have to be. So I'm sure they'll all appreciate our prayers uh, during this time. And so we certainly want to be praying that God blesses, that God meets with us, and we're praying for healing for all those who need it. Uh, we also want to remind folks of opportunities to give. We want to continue uh, maintaining our commitments to the Lord's work here in our church. And so we encourage you to give in one of three ways. You can give through our website, through Tithely. You can mail your gift in, or you can come by the church and drop it off and let us know. We'll make sure we get it. But we want to make sure everyone's being able to stay on top of their commitments, not only for tithes, but also for faith promise, missions giving. And we thank God that he's sustaining us during this time. And I know for many of you, it's a time of real prayer as maybe the work and the income side of things isn't what it used to be. But we know God is able and we're all just looking to him during this time. Uh, but. Let's just have a word of prayer now. We'll pray for our church finances. We'll pray for each of you that have some needs. And then we'll have a special message tonight from Brother Knickerbocker. Looking forward to that. But let's have a time of prayer just now. Lord, again, we come to you because you are our God. You're our provider. You're our sustainer. And Lord, you promised us, Lord, in your word that you would supply all of our needs. Lord, you told us that we can look to you in all things. And Lord, certainly finances is a need that we have. And we pray for our church finances, that you would continue to provide, help us to continue meeting the needs here locally in our church, but also around the world as we support many missionaries. Pray for our members. We know, Lord, that they need, they'll need wisdom. Uh, many of them, uh, it could be a difficult time financially. There may be some pressure there, but I pray there wouldn't be a cause for fear or doubt or worry, but that even more, that we would lean on you and rest in you and trust in you. And so, Lord, just keep providing, keep blessing, and I pray that we would keep trusting. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, before we have our message from Brother Knickerbocker, we're going to have a very special uh, song done by Sister Rena on the piano, 
And so I know it will be a blessing to you. And then we are so thankful to have our special speaker tonight, uh, Brother Dan Knickerbocker, all the way from Texas, recording his message. And I know it will be a help to your family. And so keep your Bibles handy and ready. Be uh, listening and participating and be ready to receive the truth that God has for us this evening. An honor it is to be with you again and we are excited about the church and excited about what God's doing even during this coronavirus we know that the Lord has everything in his plan he knows what's going on this is not surprising the Lord and he is using this to bring us closer to himself and as we have an emphasis on the family, the importance of having a godly family. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name that's above all names, the name of Jesus, my Savior and friend. I ask you, Lord, to speak to every heart, every family, every life, from the youngest to the oldest, from the grandparents to the children, to the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, to the aunts and the uncles, to all that will hear this message. Oh, God, I pray that you would give us 
godly homes. Thank you for the privilege and honor it is to have been raised in a Christian home. And speak to us, I pray, O oh God, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 6.33, my mom and dad chose as their life verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I've discovered that since I've been a Christian, and I've been celebrating 42 years in the ministry, I've discovered that what God said about generations is true. In Proverbs 30, verse 11, the Bible says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. I remember my father as a young boy telling me that he said one time, Dan, I wish I could just go and buy a piece of property up on a mountain, build a big fence all the way around it and just take all of our family up there and not let anybody in unless they're bringing food <laughs> or we'll make our own food. But his whole thrust was it'd be nice to get, get away from all the evil influences that you five boys are going to have to deal with. But that's not logical. That doesn't make sense. We are here on this earth to be light and salt in a world that is going crazy. We need to be stable. We need to be godly. And I want to give you 10 guidelines that will help you to raise your family for the Lord. The outline that I'm giving you today is the final legacy left by my dear mother who died on November the 11th, 1996 in a car accident. The following Evening, she was supposed to preach or teach at a ladies' meeting at Heritage Baptist Church in Arcadia, Florida. Among her notes left on the dining room table, they were her thoughts, and had, she had written these down to share with these ladies. My brother typed them up and sent them to all of us boys. There's five of us in our family. Two of my brothers are missionaries in France. I have an older brother that works for Help Ministries, working for uh, the preachers, uh, national pastors of countries all over the world. And uh, he teaches and goes to their countries. I have a brother, younger brother, Andy. He works for an environmental company. And then I have a younger brother, Pete, that's a missionary in France. But all five of us know the Lord, and four of us are in full-time service. How did that happen? You that are raising children, I want to say to you that what a responsibility you have, but what an honor. The Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord. <laughs> you want to make the Lord happy? Raise your kids for God. I remember when Anne Marie and I sat down with my dad to get some counsel, marital counsel. My dad said to me, Daniel, I've got two words for you. He said, be kind. That's all. That was the total counseling that I received from my dad when we got, when my, when Anne Marie and I got married. And you know, it was interesting. Uh, I told my dad, I don't think I want to bring kids into this world. Boy, Anne Marie looked at me like, what do you mean you don't want to have kids? And then my dad said, well, if you raise them without God, don't have any. But if you have children, raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And then I realized how stupid a statement that was that I had made. God gives us those children to raise and to glorify and honor God. Let me give you those 10 things that my mother had written down. Number one, be prayerful. 
The Bible says pray without ceasing. We are always to be in the attitude of prayer and praise. We're to rejoice in the Lord always, Paul said. And then he mentioned, and again, I say, rejoice. My mother, every morning, when she would get up, she would get a shower and then she'd make breakfast and then she'd come to the our, our rooms and uh, wake us boys up and say dinner is on, breakfast is on the stove. And then she'd go to her chair in the living room and she'd read her Bible and she'd pray. If I got up early, she was reading her Bible. If I got up late, she was on her knees praying. Wow, what an impact that had on me. I knew that my mother believed in God and that she gave my name to God every day in prayer. I will never forget when I was older, had turned into being a teenager, and I went to a preacher's meeting. I thought it was a youth rally, but I got there and heard 15, 16 messages. On the 15th message, God called me to preach. When I got home, my mom and dad met me at the door, and they said, Daniel, what happened? And you could see the anticipation in their eyes. What happened, Daniel? I said, God called me to preach. And they said, you know, every day we got on our knees at the couch and prayed for you every day. We said, oh God, get a hold of Daniel's heart. We don't want to lose him for the Lord's work. See, they feared that I might turn my back on the Lord. But they prayed and God answered. <laughs> I'll never forget when God called me into the ministry. I knew that it was the will of God and it thrilled me. It was something that happened. It was like when I got saved. I was thrilled that I was forgiven of my sins. But now, because of the prayers of my parents and the, the, all of the sacrifice and the energy that they put forth to raise us five boys, that's why we're serving the Lord. It's not by accident. It's by the careful, diligent, loving, kind, faithful leadership of our parents that now we are privileged to share with others what great things they shared with us. Number two, be an example to the believer. Teach them by example. You don't say to your children, do as I say, not as I do. No, you teach them by showing them the good and the right way. Being an example to the believer, the Bible talks about that. We're to be an example to the believer. I often thought, why didn't God put we're an example to the lost? Because certainly we need to be. But here's what the Lord was trying to get across. How can a parent raise a child for God if they're not setting an example? Did you know that the dearest thing to your life and heart ought to be those that God gives you? Whether it be a pastor in his congregation, whether it be a father and mother and their children, whether it be children and their parents, there ought to be an example set forth. I have heard parents say to me, my kid's a better example for a Christian than I am. And I've seen parents that have set such a good example that their children just followed it. And it was like, it was like automatic Really what happened was God did something in the heart of the parents that caused God to do something in the heart of the children that resulted in their believing and living the Christian life so they were an example to those that were following them. You teach by example. Number three, be united with your husband. Be united with your husband. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.21, Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I want you to notice that. Sometimes the husbands have a tendency to say, well, the Bible says you're supposed to submit. Well, the Bible does say that the wife is to be submissive. But the husband is to love. Wives have no trouble loving, where uh, no, no trouble submitting where there's true love. We understand that. And so it is with with a wife that wants to 
unite with her husband and then be connected and agreed that this is the way we're going to live. This is the way we're going to raise our children. This is the things that we want to do. These are the things that we don't want to happen because we don't want to lose our children. Some children know more about video games than they ever know about God. Some children know more about swear words than they've ever learned about the words of our great God. We are to unite. You know, it's interesting. My mom and dad, you know, children automatically try to divide their parents. Like if dad says to me, no, you can't do it, then I'll run to mom and say, mom, is it okay? Well, what did your father say? She would always say, if I went to dad and said, could I do this? He would always say, what did, what did mom say? I said, I'm not asking mom, I'm asking you. A little irritated, no doubt. But they were so united that they could not be divided. I mean, if my father gave us a spanking or, or gave us a discipline, my mother just didn't say a word. She agreed with it. And uh, maybe she didn't think it was uh, as, as important to take that strong a stand as he may have thought. She just bit her tongue and she said, Lord, you know, and you've given him the responsibility that he's going to give an account one day for all of us. I'm going to commit that to the Lord and let God take care of it. There must be a unity in the family. If there's a unity, it will show the children how to be unified. Number four, be loving but firm. Did you know many children try to be their parents' best the uh, many parents try to be their children's best friend. Did you know that we're not to be, we're not to be our children's best friend. We're to be their example as a leader and as a parent. It doesn't mean we can't love them and do wonderful things with them and have wonderful times with them, but we are there to minister to their needs. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, the Bible says foolishness is bound to the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. The Bible also says, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. As God corrects adults, adults correct children so that children one day will grow up and correct their children. That the whole purpose of the lovingness and firmness is to show that we are serious about obedience. Remember uh, King Saul when he was told to go in and take out the Midianites and, and he did partial obedience. And uh, Samuel said to obey is better than sacrifice. And uh, a rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And uh, he made it clear that, that if we are disobedient, uh, if our children become disobedient and we don't restrain them, then the police are going to be putting them in prison. I remember one time my father said, if you don't obey me, you won't obey the police. He really worked at obedience and, and the first mention of a command is to be obedient to that command. The Bible goes on to say, uh, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Sometimes it's, we don't want to correct our children because we think, oh, they're going to be mad at us and irritated. Well, we've given them that bad spirit uh, because we've not been consistent. But honestly, if you really love your child, you'll correct them. Uh, you'll speak the truth to them in love and you will see them respond. We, we must love them, but we must also take a stand. My father and mother didn't have many rules in the house, but the ones they had, you don't want to, you don't want to go against them. Uh, it would be, it would be uh, definitely uh, uh, an opportunity to go to the woodshed, if you know what I mean. Number five, be patient, but stand by your rules. You know, remember your childhood, parents, how you had to learn lessons. Remember when you were young and you did some dumb things yourself. We must teach what we've learned to our children by experience. We can learn from the drunkard not to drink. We can learn from the druggie not to take drugs. We can learn from the thief not to steal. We can learn from all of these terrible things out there that many children get involved in if we teach them 
and patiently show them, be patient with them, give them some room uh, to make decisions, but don't leave them to their wicked devices. Don't lead them to uh, peer pressure that will take them in the wrong direction. Children need to know who the good kids are and who the bad kids are and re refrain from being with the bad kids and stick around with the good kids. Maybe witness to the bad kids, but don't let them control you. Many children live under peer pressure. Many children are being bullied. So they do things to be uh, received by people. And oftentimes it's something that is to their hurt. The Bible says, and patience, experience, experience, hope, hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Remember, your children are still learning and we must work with them and help them. And where they make a mistake, we don't get on their case. We say, let me show you what you did wrong. Can I help you with that? And we teach them. It's a constant opportunity to guide them. But stay by your rules. Be patient with them. But don't do away with rules that will guide and direct your family. If there's no rules, guess what happens? There's anarchy. We would say this, if there's no police out there to protect our country, then we are going to have a country of anarchy. We must not let uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, people that have broke the law, that are in prison to be let out and let them go and make havoc of communities that once were peaceful. Now they're there's havoc and there's wickedness and ungodliness going on. We must make sure that we teach the, the rules and stay by the truths of God's word. There are still 10 commandments and they must be admonished. They must be taught. We must know what's right and what's wrong. And that's what we do in that teaching process. Number six, be consistent, be consistent. The Bible says in James 1, 6, but him, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. Here it is. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his way. I've never seen such instability among families as I do in 2020. Wow. Wow. People are so up and down, inconsistent. They're telling their kids to do one thing. They're doing something else. You can't live in private doing wrong things and expect God to use you in public. There are those that do live a double standard. There are those that, that, that live a double life, but it's no place for the Christian. We must be consistent. We must let our yea be yea, our yes, yes, and our no, no. <laughs> One thing about God, you don't have to wonder where he stands because his word is very clear. And as we learn the word of God, we learn to be consistent. You know, uh, there's a verse that, that really epitomizes my mother, godliness with contentment is great gain. And you know, my mother, when I, when I was uh, leaving to go off to Bible college, for the study of the ministry, my mother wrote me a note. And uh, in this note, she said, you left, we left before you got up and I gave you a kiss goodbye. We we're gonna miss you while you're in college, but keep a high standard of living. I will never forget that. And you know, that's helped me all these years. I don't wanna dis dis disrespect or, or, or uh, dishonor my mother but I don't want to dishonor God. And she set the example and said, keep a high standard of living. Don't, don't, don't allow yourself to get involved in things that, that would show your inconsistency or that would make you inconsistent. That's one of the things we battle as preachers because there's so many temptations that come our way and so many uh, situations where we have to we have to die to self and become alive unto Christ. And uh, we have to not let our good be evil spoken of. And we, we have to abstain from all appearance of evil. We can't be inconsistent 
and lead others also. And then I want you to notice number seven, be protective. I think it's very important that parents protect their children. The Bible says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I could tell you story after story of people that have gotten away from God by evil communications. They got on the internet. They got into going to places that they should not go. And before long, they had no desire to go to church anymore because they were living for their flesh. You must protect your children. My parents didn't let us have a TV in the home. And I'm not saying it's wrong to have a TV, but you better have it under control. Don't watch something that Jesus wouldn't watch. Is that a good standard? If, if there's cursing and sinfulness and all kinds of debauchery going on, turn it off. Don't watch stuff that you wouldn't want your children to watch. I'm saying we must protect our children there are so many temptations out there and they're going to find out much more than you'll ever know they know. In fact, they may know things that you don't even know because of areas that they've gone on the internet, things that they've come across that have drawn their attention and their flesh. We have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. If the world can't get you, your flesh will get you. And then when those two don't work, the devil will come after you. I'm simply saying that we must protect our children. We must make sure that we give them proper education. We must make sure that they are always in church. We must make sure that we set the right guidelines and set limitations. I remember one time I, uh, I told my dad, I said, hey, dad, I think I'll grow long hair. <laughs> he said, where are you going to live? And that was it. That was it. I thought, you know, do I want to trade in my, my warm bed, my meals every day, my clothes being washed to live in the street so I can have long hair? I don't think so. You see what I'm saying? When, the, when, when parents want to protect you, they're going to say there's guidelines that we're going to go. We're going to stay within perimeters where we don't go outside of those perimeters for we could fall into bad things. And we don't want that to happen. I, I thank God that my parents protected me. Number eight, be careful about spoiling your children. The Bible says in Colossians chapter three, verse 25, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he doeth. And there is no respect of persons. Be careful about spoiling your children. Don't give them too much. Make them earn. If you want to give them an allowance, make them earn it. Give them responsibilities to help them and make them finish the job. Don't, don't, don't let them start something and then not finish it. Many children today will go and take a job and they'll not like it the first day or the first week and then they just, they just walk off. They don't even tell the person they're leaving. They're, they're, they're just, I, I've talked with some store owners that, that are flabbergasted by coming in late, uh, not being dressed right, all kinds of things because the parents never set forth an example. They just let them do what they want. Uh, so I've heard this phrase, they're going to do what they want anyway. No, not as long as they're under your roof. Uh, take away their phones if you need to. Uh, put, them, put them on limitations for games and different things like that. Help them to live a normal, not an abnormal life. Because when they get old enough to go off to college and have to really make a living for themselves, they're not going to be able to do it. They're going to become bums and stand on the street with a card, you know, and get $13 an hour. Many people do that. Some deserve it, some don't. But the point that I want to make is we must train our children to be responsible, help them to learn how to take care of money and all of those things. Don't spoil your children because they'll curse you. And I've seen that happen many times. Then I want you to notice number eight. Number nine, rather, be flexible as they mature. As the children grow a little bit, then start giving them responsibility. The Bible says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Oh, help them to make small decisions. 
Let them prove that they can be trusted. Let them see God's will in their life. I'll never forget. My father said, I want all of you boys to go one year to Bible college. So I just said to him, well, just tell me which one to go to and I'll go to it. He said, oh, no, you've got to get on your knees and get along with God and pray and find out what God wants for your life. I'm not going to send you off to a college. and You marry the wrong person and then blame me for it. Isn't that smart? <laughs> I had to get along with God. It's funny because all my brothers and I all went to different colleges and, and uh, God blessed and, and God gave us our spouses. What a blessing. We, we received so much at, at God's hand because we asked God, what is your will? What do you want to do? What do you want us to do? Who do you want us to marry? Where do you want us to live? What do you want us to do in our occupation? And it's amazing how God just led and guided. And as we were... My parents were flexible. We matured. And before long, we were out serving the Lord and honoring the Lord. My mother said, let out, the, let, let out and pull the rope in a little at a time. Help them to realize that they're going to have freedom without mom and dad there. I'll never forget when I got to college, I was so glad to get away from home, man. I thought that was great. I don't have to listen to mom and dad anymore. And I'll be able to do what I want to do. And I, I'm sitting in my dorm room one day, about a month and a half after I'd been there. And I, I thought, I think I'll write a note to my parents. And I sat down to write a note. And all of a sudden, I became overwhelmed with the love that they had for me. And they never gave me any money for college. I paid my own way. The only money my dad ever sent me was when, I sold, when he sold my car. <laughs> But I started crying. Tears ran down my cheeks as I was writing a note to my parents. And I left, I left it right on the sheet that I had written the note. And I said, Mom and Dad, thank you for loving me and caring for me. I am so blessed today because of you. If it hadn't been for you, I don't know where I'd be. But now I'm studying for the ministry. God's given me a church to pastor. It's just amazing the things God did for me. And I, I must say this, that... If it hadn't been for their love and their willingness to be flexible and let me mature, I would never have done what I had done. And then number 10, be willing to let them go. Oh, it's wonderful to let your children go off to serve the Lord and honor the Lord with their lives. There, there's, there's life after kids, amen? And what a joy it is uh, to be empty nesters. And we, we love it. But you know, we love to see our children and we love to see our grandchildren. And, and we, we pray the best for them, that God would guide them and direct them. We've taught them how to live. But now it's God's business to help them to do what they've been taught. We must let them go. And then continue living the Christian life. Continue to set an example. And I want to close out this message in honor of my mother. And I would like to say this. After my mother was killed in that automobile accident, about, oh, about a month, my dad came to live with us just because I asked him to. And uh, we were sitting there talking and I said, Dad, let me ask you a question. Did mom still read her Bible and pray and get on her knees every day at her chair after all of the boys were out of the house? And he said, oh, yes. In fact, the day she was killed in that automobile accident, she did that very thing. She never failed to pray. Every time I would call my mom, she'd say, hi, Danny. I prayed for you today. Oh, the treasure of a godly mother and a godly father. I thank the Lord for my brothers who've been such a testimony and example to me. And I pray I to them. May God use us as we stay true to the teachings of God's word. If God created the family, he knows how it ought to work. And may you glorify God as well. Let's bow together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, the Savior for sinners slain. Buried, rose again, is seated at the right hand, making intercession for us. Thank you, Lord, for being there for us. Guide us and direct us and lead us in the good and the right way. May we serve you all the days of our life. And may those that are under the sound of my voice, may they put these 10 
truths to practice. And may it cause their families to give you pleasure as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are so thankful for that timely challenge to our families, to all of us as believers. And I just want us, as we conclude our service here in just a moment, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. But I'm going to ask you folks listening at home, if you would gather around with whoever is there with you, and can we just pray for our families tonight? You dads, you moms, gather your kids with you and pray for your family. Pray for God's protection, for, for God to guide you and direct you in these days as our, we have an enemy that seeks to wreak havoc in our homes. And pray for all of the families of our church. Pray for my family. And all of us need prayer tonight regarding this important, important building block of our church, of our society. I'm going to close with prayer. But again, as we close our meeting tonight, you pray at home. And let's make this a matter that we bring before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you for Brother Knickerbocker and his spirit and his obedience to you as he shared the messages that you've laid on his heart today. And I pray that we would not just be hearers, but we would be doers. Lord, we pray that you would bless and honor the Christian homes in our church. Bless each dad, bless each mom, bless the children, that we would all fulfill the biblical roles that you've given to us. And Lord, may we in our homes, Lord, be an example to the lost and dying world around us of what Jesus Christ can do when we give him our all. And so, Lord, just continue to bless our church during this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes our Sunday evening meeting. We'll see you again Wednesday night for prayer meeting and Bible study. God bless and good night. Yeah.